There's a side of China that you've seen before, and a side that you have not. My name is Karen Muller. China has exploded onto the world stage, a global powerhouse. And yet, we know so little about them. So I decided to go alone for three months to live with rice farmers. Yak herders, bakers, and businessmen. Nothing prepared me for what I found, and it all started in a most ordinary spot, a Beijing park. It's so popular that regulars start lining up an hour early to be the first ones in. They can barely wait. She's 82, and she's 78. This might be why the Chinese live so long. Most aren't looking for a hardcore Western workout. They're here to enjoy themselves. Though badminton isn't nearly as exciting as Jian Zhu, hacky sack. It originated in China over 2,000 years ago. <laughs> Front and back. They make it look so easy. How did they get so good? If you don't have that kind of expertise, you're still welcome at the daily calisthenics class. These guys show up seven days a week, catch up on the local gossip, work out for about 90 minutes, and clap a lot. If that isn't quite challenging enough, to master the sword takes years of training. It's one of the highest achievements in Tai Chi. Though beginners are always welcome. Breathing is as important as the technique itself. But what if you're looking for something a little more cutting edge? For the young, and young at heart. And not just women. It's downright sexy. Absolutely contagious. And a darn good workout. Do they look intimidating? They're not. The whole thing is, quite frankly, irresistible. So come join in the fun. But maybe you don't feel like sweating in the heat. Or you're too shy to shake your booty. More the cerebral type. What better place than a park to practice your calligraphy? They're mostly quotes from Chinese literature or poetry. It's called earth writing. It first appeared in a Beijing park 20 years ago, and now thousands are doing it throughout China. If you want to do something a little more permanent, follow the flute to the top of the hill. Not him, 
him. Each drawing takes several weeks. He often gives them away when he's done. But perhaps you're looking for something a bit less solitary. Plenty of well-known singers perform for free in Beijing's parks. Or, if you'd rather, you can have your own moment in the spotlight. To a slightly smaller crowd. If you can't sing, you can always show off your children. Today, there's a free fashion show for little kids. If you don't have a child, just get up and dance. Waltzing is extremely popular in China. Though here it goes by the delightful name of friendship exchange dancing. If you're lucky, you'll find a partner. If not, it's perfectly okay to dance by yourself. It usually doesn't take long for someone to step in. Even if you have no idea what you're doing. If only they had better music. But wait, this is the park. Of course they have a full-size choir. They set up every Saturday with a battery-powered piano. Despite the stifling Beijing summer heat, I love the conductor. That's not to say you can't just do ordinary stuff, like enjoy the flowers, chat, read the paper, it's posted daily, ride a boat on the lake, enjoy a game of cards at the local tea house, eat some rat's heads, or get your ears cleaned. Professional ear cleaners are available in almost every restaurant. Despite their somewhat alarming implements, ear cleaning brings up fond childhood memories for many Chinese and is much more pleasant than the massage that follows. Once a week, certain Chinese parks host an even more unusual event, like this one in Shanghai, otherwise known as the People's Park Blind Date Corner. It's where concerned parents go to find their unmarried offspring a husband or a wife. Thousands of them gather every Saturday and Sunday from noon to 5 p.m. They chat up prospective in-laws, then pin their children's resumes to umbrellas, paper bags, tree trunks, or anywhere on the sidewalk where there's an inch of space. They include the most important stats, age, height, income, 
education, and, crucially, whether they own an apartment and a car. There's even a special word for it, chefangjibe, car and home equipped. There's one other critical piece of information. Whether the prospective partner is registered to live in Shanghai. Without the proper paperwork, their children won't have access to education, health care, and other government services. The whole thing feels sadly unromantic, rather like a cross between a farmer's market and an internet dating site. Chinese society puts great value on the survival of the family line. Since most urban Chinese only have one child, parental pressure to get married can be intense. In fact, the resumes without photos usually means that mom and dad are here without their children's knowledge or consent. The August heat is clearly no obstacle. Neither is distance. There's even an overseas corner for children who live abroad. Professional matchmakers set up shop near the park's entrance. Since there are almost three times as many women seeking partners as there are men, the matchmakers generally don't accept any female over the age of 30. They're known as Sheng Nu, leftover women. There's only one other stumbling block to parental gratification and marital bliss. Modern young Chinese women have gotten rather picky about their men. Her mother's been coming here for years. Her daughter only likes really handsome, highly educated men. And, unfortunately, she's still in love with her ex. Never mind. You never know what might happen next weekend. Of course, not everyone wants to get married. Some choose a religious life instead. They may even enter Shaolin Monastery. Built deep in the heart of the Song Mountains in Henan Province over 1,500 years ago. It's home to the elusive Kung Fu warrior monks, the Chinese equivalent of America's cowboys, with almost superhuman fighting skills. But unlike most Hollywood settings, Shaolin Kung Fu is real. Though the temple itself has been destroyed and rebuilt time and time again, Shaolin is now a major corporation, and its head monk is the CEO. They make millions off tourism every year. Some come to worship. Others dream of becoming Kung Fu warriors themselves. Even Westerners aren't immune. The monks make a killing selling certified sacred Shaolin fruit, honey, and nuts. But all those tourists are missing the most interesting thing about Shaolin. Nobody notices the steady trickle of monks disappearing around the corner behind the temple. They're heading for a rundown village filled with children, young boys mostly, living in boarding schools. It's a real-life Chinese Hogwarts for aspiring young martial artists. Some start as young as five years old. The goal? To achieve supernatural powers and supreme wisdom expressed through Shaolin Kung Fu. 
But the reality is not nearly as glamorous as it sounds. They get up at 5 a.m. and run for miles before the sun comes up each day. Only then do they start to train. Among the 20,000 Chinese students, I find one young foreigner, a 14-year-old Vietnamese boy called Pham Ong Zong. He read about Shaolin when he was 10 and convinced his parents to bring him here. I love the Shaolin Kung Fu. Like Harry Potter, Pham Ong Zong is very much an outsider. Maybe, maybe sometimes they, get, they don't like my culture and my country. So while his classmates are hanging out together, Zong finds other things to do. Writing some Chinese or drink some tea. Chinese tea. But even if you're popular, Life is not easy here. They train relentlessly, seven days a week. Every square inch of level ground is prime workout real estate. And there are no ninja fighting sticks or mystical techniques. Just dirt, sweat, cement, and a thousand repetitions. Shaolin Kung Fu gets passed on orally from master to disciple. <laughs> There are over 700 series of movements. Though most students only learn the most popular 72. Their sensei is more than just a trainer. He's a father to these kids. The only break they get is when it rains and the training grounds become unusable. Meals are healthy and vegetarian. served out of buckets and into bowls. And wolfed down in huge quantities. They bathe and brush their teeth in the alley out back. Sleep in crowded dorm rooms and do lots and lots of chores. Though they do get to relax from time to time and just hang out. Their energy is bottomless. They share everything from bicycles to rollerblades. There's the other one. But the truth about these boarding schools is even more surprising. Shaolin, I find out, is where juvenile delinquents get sent. It's a boot camp for problem kids. The teachers deliberately work them half to death, channeling their aggression, teaching them absolute obedience, 
and Buddhist moral values. They recite the Shaolin Code of Honor before every meal and spend hours listening to long lectures several nights a week. It seems to work. They're bone tired. But they barely twitch. Zun soaks up every word. For entertainment, they're allowed the occasional sing-along. They sure don't look like bad boys to me. They all dream of becoming movie stars, or at least getting a place on the famous Shaolin Temple performing Kung Fu team. Most will eventually become policemen or join the military. With one exception. I want to go in America. I very want to go in Harvard. Zong isn't the only one having a hard time fitting in. Over 8% of Chinese citizens are ethnic minorities with their own languages, cultures, and beliefs. Most live far from China's coastal cities, beyond the reach of planes or trains. To get to them, you have to take a bus. If you associate bus travel with uncomfortable seats, and sleepless nights, think again. This bus has beds. Though you're not getting on board until you go through an x-ray machine and take off your shoes. There's even a special cubby hole to put them in. That's not the only rule. You have to listen to a safety briefing. Seat belts are mandatory. And the driver doesn't leave until everyone's belted in. If you're having trouble sleeping, there's an endless supply of Kung Fu movies at high volume. Best of all, you're going to wake up to the most spectacular view. There are a few things you should know about sleeper buses before you buy a ticket. It's crucial to get the right berth. Avoid the holidays at all costs and the start and end of the school term. And stay away from the back of the bus or you'll get sardined in with half a dozen other passengers. Smoking is absolutely forbidden, a rule that's generally ignored. There are no bathrooms on the bus, but it pulls in at a rest stop every few hours, so you can use the toilet and stretch your legs. The longer trips stop for meals as well. The food stalls are incredibly efficient. They can feed 40 people in less than 15 minutes. 
though today there's no need to hurry. Breakdowns are very common. This one took 52 hours to fix. The Chinese are a supremely patient people. It's a chance to get to know your fellow passengers and make some new friends. A late arrival may be inconvenient, but this is a much bigger concern. Driving in China is downright dangerous, and buses are no exception. But the driver isn't always to blame. China's rural roads are narrow and windy and difficult to negotiate. Once you're in the mountains, there's no room for mistakes. Landslides are common. So are potholes, especially in the rainy season. And construction can add days to even the shortest trip. But better roads are not necessarily safer roads. There's only one real rule to driving in China. Pass whenever possible, no matter what the risk. In case it isn't obvious, this is a two-way street. They have over a quarter million road fatalities each year. It's okay to pass slower cars into oncoming traffic, as long as you honk first. You can also pass on blind turns, and even inside tunnels. Three-wheelers don't really count as vehicles. And to ride a motorbike, you have to be a little bit insane. It feels a lot like a video game. A traffic jam can actually come as a relief. Though eventually everyone gets back on board. This is the only way to reach Kanding. In the shadow of the Himalayas, it's a hidden gateway to the Tibetan world. With a population of 100,000, Kanding is the largest city in Sichuan's wild western province. The Chinese government has worked hard to modernize the entire city. To the east is Han China. To the west, Tibet. With a bit of western influence thrown in. The Chinese have brought infrastructure. Everything from bridges and roads to oversized TV screens. Like the mighty Jadu River, born in the untamed Himalayas, that cuts through Kanding, Tibetan culture holds strong. Patru was born in these mountains and raised his family here. He has agreed to take me high into the Himalayas, to his childhood home. Our goal is not to reach the mountaintop, is to live with the Tibetan nomadic yak herders who still practice the old ways in the hidden valleys between these snow-capped peaks. Because we're still technically in Sichuan province, we can travel without special permits, even though, culturally, this is Tibet. We follow the river. The further from civilization, the wilder it gets. It's high summer, and the alpine meadows are in full bloom. But these mountains are not to be trifled with. The weather can go bad in minutes.
and the temperature dropped 20 degrees. Luckily, Patru knows every tree and outcrop. He doesn't miss a chance to greet old friends and chase down local gossip. At last, we reach the valley home of Tering Mo and her husband, Wu Truje, where they graze their yaks during the summer months. They've been waiting for us and the fresh produce we brought with us from Kanding. It's difficult to cultivate anything at this altitude. Maybe this is where French fries really came from. Fresh corn is such a treat that even the patient setting can barely wait to eat. After this, it's back to traditional Tibetan fare, like gunja, Tibetan bread, made with tea, butter, barley flour, and sugar, and kneaded to just the right consistency. The Tibetans prefer to eat it raw, but it can be cooked like pita bread on the stovetop. Their tents lie in the shadow of the mighty mountain range of Gonga Shan. It's August, the warmest month of the year, though the river is still icy cold. Herding yaks is men's work. The best grazing is across the river. The yaks need to build up a layer of fat if they're to survive the coming winter. Though if you're going to convince them to wade across that cold water, you'd better have a good throwing arm. In case you think they have an easy job, yaks have a tendency to wander. That's 14,000 feet. And someone has to go get them at day's end. A rogue yak is a more serious issue. Chasing it away is an hour-long battle. Best left to the youngsters. A typical Tibetan family will have some sheep and horses, but yaks are the real measure of their wealth. Back at the tents, Tsering has been working non-stop since dawn. Her 12-year-old son is in town, getting an education. Tsering takes pride in her nomadic culture, but she wants her child to make his own decisions. Traditional life may seem romantic, but it's not easy. Beds are made of bundled sticks with, if you're lucky, a felted blanket on top. The stove burns both wood and dried yak dung. There's no toilet and no shower, just an ice cold stream that doubles as their water supply. Most Tibetans own enormous, vicious, mastiff dogs, bred to scare off predators. He may not look the part, but don't be fooled. He's ready to take on anything. And win. Early one morning, I finally realize why they're so happy here. Tsering is waiting, but her smile isn't for me. It's for her yaks. And they love her as much as she loves them. They come when called, running down the valley. She rewards each one with a handful of salt and grain. 
Around her, these half-wild, sharp-horned beasts morph into docile pets, allowing her to separate even their youngest calves. Boutrouge stands back. The yaks are not as fond of him. Setting makes sure mine is safely hobbled. Even after I try to remove my foreign smell, this yak is still not happy that it's me. The Tibetan nomads are profoundly connected to both their animals and the land that their ancestors have inhabited for over a thousand years. An hour later, the milking's done, but Sering's work has only just begun. Today, they're going to make yak butter and cheese. Setting is one of the most beautiful women I've ever met. It's not just her high cheekbones and smooth skin. She radiates a sense of peace and makes everyone feel like family. <laughs> her yaks provide her family with almost everything they need their homes, fuel to cook and stay warm, the cash they need to buy medicines, and most importantly, butter and cheese. Female yaks, technically called nax, only produce as much milk as a goat, so not a single drop gets wasted. The milk is heated to 145 degrees. Once upon a time, they used the stomach of a goat. Nowadays, they have a newfangled churning machine. Most nomads drink 20 to 60 cups of yak butter tea per day. The fat provides much needed calories against the cold. But most importantly, it functions as their currency. This is their bank account. Fresh yak butter can last up to a year. Tsering Mo and her family know how to survive up here year-round, as their ancestors have done since ancient times. But I can't help wonder, how will they maintain their nomadic way of life when the world is modernizing all around them? When we get back to Kanding, something is going on. A crowd has gathered in the town square to dance. You can't even tell who's in charge. They all seem to be following each other. It's mostly older women, with a sprinkling of youngsters thrown in. This is a Tibetan custom, eagerly adopted by the local Han Chinese and no one seems to care if they know all the moves. The men are mostly standing on the sidelines, though a few are braver than the rest. As darkness falls, everyone begins to blur together. An ancient Tibetan dance in a modern Chinese square. I think these women are onto something. It won't solve all their problems, but it's not a bad place to start.